Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Black Baseball Mixtape. I am your host, Cheats, and joining me right now for a special conversation. I am so excited. I was told a long time ago, if you have a favorite writer, you need to read more books. <laughs> but but it's safe to say Howard Bryant uh, is one of my favorite writers after reading uh, his biography on Hank Aaron after reading The Heritage. And now I'm reading or just finished reading not too long ago. The book is Ricky, uh, The Life and Legend of American Original. I'm joined by award winning writer, author, journalist, all of those things. Howard Bryant. Howard, welcome to the mixtape. No, oh, good to be back. I think when was the last time we did this? A couple years ago, right? We did this a couple years ago, and I remember uh, leaving that conversation saying we could, I could have talked to you. Now, look, you get this all the time, but I, I love that conversation saying I could have talked to you for hours on end. And this was leading up. This was, the, I think, the around the time of the heritage. We were talking mostly about the heritage mm -hmm. and the relationship around uh, black athletes and sports. And I made a fatal flaw in that conversation that I have not that I've corrected in this conversation. And I'll tell you what it is. I was kind of probably three quarters of the way because this was early on in the heritage. We were, I was probably three quarters of the way through the book. And by the time I finished the book, I was like, I've got so many questions. I got so many more <laughs> questions for Howard. Um, this time, I, I will tell you, and I know a lot of my friends have as well. As soon as Ricky hit the shelf, pre-order, read it within the first, what, month and a half or so, got all all of it ready. What What has your reaction been, just, just before we even get into it, writing a book on Ricky Henderson and then putting it out and getting the reaction? Because Ricky's one of those athletes where everybody has a Ricky story. H how's it been since the book's been released? Well, it's been great. I mean, I think that every time you do a uh, – and, and first of all, thanks for having me on the show again um, – always enjoy good conversations. Uh, I think that the very first thing when you're finishing a project is the relief that it's done. Um, <laughs> when I think about the you know, idea of, I always refer to them as my five steps of anxiety. And when you get to, you know, step four, it's, you know, did you do the job? Because there's no going back. There's no erasing. There's no edits. It's between two covers. It's going to live as a as a as a mediocre book or or a good book or however it means to you or something that didn't quite hit the mark or something that you're that exceeded your expectations. But whatever it is, it's done, and so you have to sort of sit with that. And I think once the book came out, um, I was I, I was I was happy because I think it was a different kind of book for me. I mean, I think that the real the reason why I was I did this in the first place. There were so many reasons why I took the subject on, um, but I think that one of the biggest reasons was after this decade of things that we've all been going through, especially as black people in this country, um, it had been fairly traumatic for all of us when you go back from, you know, Trayvon to Ferguson to Kaepernick, and it's just a nonstop battery of, of events. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't even include, you know, Philando, you know, Castile and Alton and all the names and so yep. many names that you forget the names and you forget the dates because one keeps getting replaced by the next. And then obviously while I was working on this book, you move into George Floyd and and all of that. And so and Brianna Taylor and just keep it keeps going. So one of the reasons why I wanted to do the book in the first place was I wanted to get back to something that I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I need a subject that makes me remind my that reminds me about the things that I really like about sports and the thing that I, things that I like about this business are the things that I like about life in general. And because I really didn't feel like I could hear myself anymore. I mean, how many more times can you write about kneeling and how many more times can you be called un-American and how many times can you, uh, you know, argue with people or debate with people who have no real interest in, in you? Sure. They have more interest in reinforcing their own positions. And, you know, from these, you know, from this time period, I didn't know if I could hear anything I was writing anymore. I didn't know if it was having any impact. I didn't know if I could feel it. I didn't know if, if I felt like anything was being moved forward. Was this the same column I wrote last week and the week before? Mm -hmm. Because it's not, it was so nonstop. 
And then obviously when I wrote Full Dissidence um, after The Heritage, oh, that sort I of that, that sort of grounded me into into thinking, okay, now you're 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 free, you're clear, um, you know that I'm not in this social media space of constantly sparring with white people about your experience. Like I don't do that anymore. You know, I'll tell you what I think, but I'm not here to debate you about it. And right. you have enough evidence. They don't need me to talk to them about these things. Um, they can talk to each other, which is what the conversation is really all about. And so, so Ricky was just something that I was like, one, I always feel like when I'm working on a project, um, there's a thread to the work that I do. Um, not to sound, you know, you know, arrogant about it or, sure. or presumptuous, There's a process. Yeah. but there, there are certain things that I want to try to talk about. And Ricky, Ricky really did sort of cover a space that I hadn't gotten to yet. And I think that when you look at the history of the 20th century in sports, you really can break it down into three eras. And the first era is the immigration era, where you come out of the 1800s, you get into the 20th century, and you have this glut of new immigrants coming into this country. Um, you know, the Jews and the Poles and the Italians and I, everyone's coming in over the last 30 or 40 years and their children are becoming Americanized. And how did those second generation or the first generation Americans born in this country, how did they integrate into the country? And it was usually through sports. Right. You know, there's a reason why the Yankees are the you know Italian baseball team during Absolutely. all those years. There's a reason you know you look at the boxers, whether you know all of those different boxers in, in, in back in the day. This is you know the Jewish athletes in the in the 20s and the 30s in the Olympics. You know you learn how to read a box score. That's how you become American as an American, especially as the boys as an American boy. That's how it how you become part of the culture. And then the second era is an era that I'm very familiar with, which is the integration era. This is the era where you reach Jackie Robinson and then you start moving into this heritage of, of black athletes leading the way to, to black people becoming full frontal, you know, you know, front, front facing in the culture instead of being in the background sure. the whole time. Now you're dealing with these institutions that are now forced to to add us into the social milieu and the third era is the money the economic era you start hitting free agency and now it's not a game anymore it never was a game but now it's a multi-billion dollar industry and not only are the are the players i'm sorry are the teams making tons of money but now the players are too once you hit 75 now you're dealing with a different type of athlete and you were already dealing with a different type of athlete in the 1960s. You're dealing with the black athlete who's beginning to assert themselves, who's not saying yes, sir, no, sir. Now they're starting to make a little bit of money there. And you're adding television to that. Now add free agent money to it as well. And you're dealing with a totally different type of player. Now we deal with this today. Like it's no big deal because today it is no big deal. It's 50 years later. Right. Um, damn near. So. But that period of time created a different athlete. You could have done this book on Michael Jordan. You could have done this book on Reggie Jackson. You could have done this book on, on Ricky, on this first generation of super rich athlete. And what did that do to the relationship of the, between the team and the player? What did it do to the relationship between the players and the fans? You're dealing with, both now are dealing with the black player who's not homegrown Right. But now is going to be the most, I don't know, maybe the highest paid player and the front facing um, member of your team. And this is not something that that sports had been used to. And so Ricky really did uh, embody all of those different subjects. And, and I had wanted to do this years ago. Um, <laughs> and we and, and I wanted to do it after my second book, after um, after Juicing the Game came out in 2005. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do this. And I didn't really get a lot of response from publishers because the mm. publishers were thinking, well, there's no happy ending here because players are, you know, fans are pissed off about money. They're, you know, they're always upset about you know, how much the money the players are making. It's not a heroic story. There's not a happy ending to this story because people are always so bitter about it. And I was like, well, if there's one thing we know, people are fascinated by money. They'll always read about money. 
Sure. Um, so I was happy to now have the opportunity to do that. And, and Ricky did represent that type of player who's that first generation of player to say, where's my money? I'm entitled to it. Don't compare me to the plumbers or the electricians out there. Compare me to the guy wearing the uniform next to me. I want to get paid. Different, different time. I do have to ask, though, because you're right in regards to the time period and where we were. And you're right about all of it. But you could have picked easier subjects. I mean, obviously, Ricky Henderson, maybe, you know, reputation known well. There's been other kind of attempts to try to get into what was Ricky Henderson. So in in, in reading the book, you know, you, you hear, OK, Kirby Puckett's making, you know, is making this much or Tony Gwynn is, is mentioned in the book as well. But you dove right into, I think, one of the most. Uh, you know, an individual that is an enigma in many ways, misunderstood in many ways, and, and awesome, revered in many ways. Why? What was it about Ricky Henderson that's of all the kind of baseball players or subjects you could have picked during that time period? You picked one that is by far the most electrifying, but also the most misunderstood and, and kind of known as a curmudgeon, right? Yeah, well, Ricky's not easy, and Ricky's <laughs> difficult. I mean, Ricky's absolutely not easy, and very, very difficult, and very and enigmatic. Is um, you know, enigmatic is the the way to describe him. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, there's no there's no question about it. And, so, was it always and, Ricky in your mind? Was it always Ricky? This was the this was the subject. Well, that we I had think to that do. one of the questions was with my late great friend Pedro Gomez. I remember we were in Arizona one day talking about this and talking about um, how many people out there in baseball, and baseball was what I felt like writing about, could actually carry a full biography. There aren't as many as you think. Mm. How many players actually have the numbers to do it? How many have the interest? It's not just about putting up numbers. I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, people keep trying to pump him up even because he hit a whole bunch of home runs. But I am so bored by Albert Pool Holtz. I would never, ever, ever read a book about Albert Pool. He bores the shit out of me. And so um, you have to carry all these other things. Do you also have import outside of the sport? Do you have an impact that it's going to allow me to get into the other types of subjects that I wanted to get into? Mm -hmm. And Ricky really did because really Ricky did. was really the... Did. Ricky was the avenue for me to get into something that I'd always wanted to get into, which was the Great Migration. I wanted to talk about, you know, that was a big piece of this because we talk about the Great Migration and all of these different elements. We talk about how it remakes Detroit, how it remade Chicago, how it changed the East Coast and Philadelphia and Boston, New York, um, and obviously Los Angeles. And of course, Oakland completely changed Oakland. But what nobody talks about, and, and I'm talking about us, the professionals who do this for a living, all the time we never talk about how the great migration impacted sports mm -hmm. where all these great players moved into these other spaces they moved into these new cities and and remade these cities and people now talk about you know eddie murray and eric davis and all these guys remaking Absolutely. los angeles and and then they talk about you know, obviously the great players in oakland and it was stunning to me when i was doing the research that all these players, you know, because it's, you know, whenever you go to Oakland, it's legendary that Ricky's there and Dave Stewart's mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. Bill Russell and Joe Morgan. The numbers are staggering for a city of that size. But then you go into the research and you realize, oh, they all come from like three states. They're all from <laughs> Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, it's and a lot of them the are from South. the same neighborhood. <laughs> right. And they moved to the same place. You and, did a great job in the that, book articulating that they could only live in certain neighborhoods. They go live in one neighborhood, West right. Oakland. So you get, you get this concentration. Yeah, exactly. And so you've got someone like Bill Russell and Huey Newton growing up down the street from each other right. in Monroe, Louisiana, end up living down the street from each other in Oakland. I don't even know if they knew each other. But this <laughs> is, you know, this is the amazing piece of that story. And I think that one of the things that I was really um, interested in was the relationship between black people and going out west that really mm -hmm. physically when you're looking at you know trying to find a a space that's going to allow you to have a life mm -hmm. and not just emotionally but also physically by the time you get to the west coast there's nowhere else to go nowhere else to go you're in the, you're in the ocean you got to be in the ocean yep. exactly and so and if you can't go back because if you go back you feel like you're you're going backwards so this was it. And that's why I think it has a lot to do with 
um, I think it has a lot to do with the Oakland spirit, which is why you know, Oakland's got that kind of you know swagger to it. It was, you know, I don't know if this was intentional or unintentional or, or if you've even got this feedback, but for me, it's the single most interesting talking point of the book was the map that you put in the front. I've screenshotted the map and showed this to so many people and say, can you believe all of these people came from migrated from the South to Oakland? Look at these neighborhoods. You, and it wasn't just sports. There was a Pointer Sisters in there. You mentioned Huey Newton in there. Oakland played such a giant backdrop in the entire kind of fabric of this book. Uh, and, and it was amazing. What you talked about it, but did you, while you're doing this research, does there, was there things about just Oakland in general that you were just like, man, this is crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think that the number one thing and the map was one of my favorite things to do. It was um, so awesome. That was, that was one of my favorite ideas. I was like, let's try to get this, you know, is there some way to get this into the book? And I was like, yeah, frontispiece would be perfect. Right when you open the book, there's the map. Oh, so and good. of course the map, so the map would then again sort of create rivalries from people like some of my boys would call me. <laughs> they, would, they would crank call me and, you know, for guys that didn't get on the map. And be, right, hey, that's the thing. Map? <laughs> yeah, how do you, not, you can't get hey. everyone on the map. And one of my boys called me up and he was like, hello, hey man, yeah, this is Gary Payton. I'm reading your book, man. How come I ain't on a map? Exactly. Gary Payton like, would be the person to call you too. Exactly, right? And I was like, well, look, there's a there's a rhyme or reason to it. It's this period. It's this migration. It's not everybody who was born in Oakland. <laughs> it was people who showed up between these years, number one. Oh, that's number great. two, I tried to elevate it to the Hall of Fame or very close or germane to the story, guys who all hung out with each other. Right. Um, you know, I love the fact that Sly and the Family Stone and Paul Silas and and you know, Kurt Flood, they all lived a few blocks from each other. A few blocks from each other. Yeah, it's in, it's really incredible. And Ricky and Mosby and Pettis. And one of my favorite things about the map was that, you know, you had a guy like Gary Pettis who grew up in both. He grew up in North Oakland. And then in like the sixth or seventh grade, he moved down to East Oakland. Right. And right. so at first I said to him, where do you want to be on the map? And he was like, I'm, I'm, nor I'm North Oakland. I'm North Oakland. So I put him in North Oakland right next to Mosby and Ricky, which is where he grew up. And then by the time the book was almost finished, when I was almost done with the manuscript, I was just going over and fact checking and I sent the map over to Dave Stewart. And mm -hmm. Stu looked at the map and he said, Gary Pettis is East Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> so That's I had to call hilarious. Pettis and I was like, no, I was like, hey man, I said, here's, I said, here's the map. Oh, Let me goodness. know how you feel. I said, I will tell you that there's been a little <laughs> descent that Dave Stewart is claiming you down in East Oakland, down his way. And he said, you from around the way down here. You're not from up there. Oh, and I said, hilarious. but I said, but I asked you earlier and you said North Oakland. So however you feel. But the funny part is Dave Stewart's a right. very serious man, too. You can't, exactly. really, you can't mess with Dave Stewart. Two days later, I get a call from Pettis. Um, can we change? It's too late to change the map. <laughs> but <laughs> Dave, called, Dave called him. Exactly. Could you put hilarious. me back in, in, in East Oakland? I was like, oh, okay. This and We call that the stew effect. That's hilarious. So, can, I, so, yeah. can I mention something? Because during the book, and, and Ricky is front and center it, you know, it, throughout the entire book, I find myself fascinated with some of the, they're not insular, but just some of the people around Ricky during certain parts of his life. And you, and you mentioned Dave Stewart, who's been a constant from Oakland, longtime friend. Uh, some of the, can I tell you some of the other people that really fascinated me in this book? And the time that you touched on the New York years and Dave Winfield, like mm -hmm. I was just sitting here waiting for the next, the, like who's going to write the definitive Dave Winfield piece? Because I was fascinated by even some of the, the way you approached the game, the way you talk, you wore the suits and obviously mm -hmm. the, the war, uh, the war with Steinbrenner, which like, yeah, man, he, I don't know, like, all I know is Steinbrenner by reputation. His reputation in this book, see, like, I'm looking at Steinbrenner like Daniel Snyder, like, we're trying to fight somebody. Oh, like, if I saw well, Steinbrenner on the street. Okay, that was just like, and you know who else was, I mean, Mike Norris, clearly, just a, an amazing Favorite character. Through what am I really all time? What a good person. Love, 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 Mike. Uh, and then Dennis Eckersley. Comes also off a favorite. Uh, look, I know what Dennis Eckersley looks like. I've seen him play in real time, like the highlights and so forth. In this book, 
Dennis Eckersley looks comes off like the guy that if you played him on the basketball court, he would be talking the most trash and just oh, be no like, doubt. look, let's just let's just get he like you know I hate to say it this way, but you know how there's certain white people that no matter where they are, they're just gonna they're a part of whatever the culture's doing and it just seems seamless. Is that is that Dennis Eckersley? Because it is seems so like act, that is okay. so act to a T. Well, Eck Eck was born in Oakland. Right. I was just you saying, know? but I, so but Eck, I was surprised because you don't like you don't hear like you gotta go through something like this to be like, oh no, that that seems to be Oh no, no, that's prop exactly. That's on brand for Eck. <laughs> And, and, you know, we were so treated in Boston for all these years when Eck came back and being on the broadcast, because to have Eck on the broadcast every single day made watching the Red Sox so enjoyable, regardless oh, of crazy. the record. I mean, the way he talks, the way, he, you know, he has his own language, you know, the way he talks about things, the, the terminology he uses, you know, that fastball had some hair on it, right? I mean, he just says different, you know, his whole delivery is different. And you talk to Eck, Eck gets excited about baseball, he loves sport. And so, and Eck could really get inside of you um, and really show you what competition meant. Like, and that's what baseball really is. When you start to break down the essence of baseball, it starts out with a confrontation. It doesn't start out with a jump ball where the ball goes up in the air and eight other guys have a chance to touch it. It's you versus me. Let's get it on. That's all. Awesome. That's baseball. That's the first. That's the first act of every baseball of every pitch. Right. Batter yeah. versus pitcher. How? Are, act, yeah. Oh no, good. And like I said I know you. You're on a tight schedule today. I want to be so respectful of your time. I do look. We. we Ricky, I, I do want to ask. Um. Because as it, it's it's such a career trajectory arc, and I, it's it's fitting that uh, in many ways Ricky said that his favorite athlete is Muhammad Ali. Because you look at uh, if you kind of put a parallel to Muhammad Ali's career trajectory arc in regards to being you know fans and being received, and as he got older and less threatening, what people look at him. When you when you kind of look at the totality of Ricky Henderson's career and and, and you look at it at the end and you look at what they're doing today with like you talk about in the book, mass analytics and all the saber metrics. All of that stuff proves that Ricky was probably a better player, yeah. not a worse player than what he was constantly underappreciated in many ways during his time. When you kind of look at the overall arc of his career, do you think that he he was given a fair shake? I know what I think what Ricky would say about that, but do you think he was given a fair shake? No, because I don't think people appreciated the things that he did that made him a great player. Mm -hmm. um, there's no question that he is a towering figure in the sport. You look at his records, there are going to be certain records that you look at, whether it's Cy Young's 511 wins, and he's got 200, you know, more wins, you know, 150 more wins than the the contemporary player, the highest total contemporary player, which is who, which is Maddox at 355. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to take the old era and put it into the new era, obviously Walter Johnson's got over 400 wins. But, you know, when you look at it for today's guys, Cy Young's 511 and Greg Maddox's 355, it's like it's two different universes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same thing with Ricky. Mm -hmm. Ricky is out stealing whole teams now. You know, the, and, you know, and he was doing it when he was playing. Right. And the fact that he's got, you know, 1406, his stolen base total is going to be one of those records that just ain't getting broken. You can't, who's going to steal Never. 1,400 bases? And and also that he's 600 stolen bases ahead of the second guy. Right. I mean, he obliterated that record book. And that's another reason when you're asking me why, you know, you take Ricky on as a subject. The, the reason, of course, is because people don't talk about him in those ways but he absolutely obliterated the record book as a person who was criticized for not working hard <laughs> That's... he's the guy who didn't put out he's the guy that look at his output and he's the guy that you don't think played the game and that's the like. What more yeah. would you have wanted him? Do you? I mean, it's in and the book. But exactly. At the end, that's it's the like tension what more of the book. would you, you know, have wanted him to do? Exactly. And that's the tension of the book. The tension of the book is, well, how could he be all these things that you said and still produce that? Maybe the analysis wasn't quite right. The, and the other piece of that, too, is how do you change from being a guy who was clearly one of the most disliked players in the game early on 
to the way people talk about Ricky now. Everybody wants to tell Ricky stories around the campfire. So this is another <laughs> example of how time and accomplishment changes people's sure. view of the same person. He's the same guy, just as dominant, just as great, just as amazing. But the world has softened around him. And so these stories are always very good barometers of time and how time shifts us. It's it's often said, and I, and and when we talk about Muhammad Ali, we say it this way: he's lovable because he's less he he's not threatening anymore. He's no, no that's right. Threat. Is Ricky he's not in the same anymore. boat? Is Ricky in the same boat? Yeah, I think Ricky's in a very similar boat because I think things began to turn for him when he was reaching the end, and people started to miss him. And he wasn't a threat financially anymore. He wasn't complaining nearly as much or as loudly about being the highest paid player in the game because he knew he wasn't the best player in the game anymore. Mm -hmm. And so Ricky's years of complaining about money were over. And then suddenly people began to rehabilitate him as a character. He suddenly he was this in between Satchel Page and Yogi Berra, you know, you know, character instead of being the guy who was always complaining about his salary, which is what he had been, you know, early on once he left New York, the the Oakland, the second Oakland years were all about him getting paid, getting respect, and he's making his Hall of Fame push as one of the great immortal players. Well, at the same time, his own manager Tony La Russa is like, yeah, Ricky's not really a superstar, and and, and the Caseca and the Caseca Wars, and then a Caseca <laughs> contract, and once again, oh, but this is this is oh. the thing when we talk about that third era. You're talking about now it's public, it's clear. These guys aren't making, you know, forty thousand dollars during the season and then working insurance, you know, as an insurance man or a bartender in the off season. Now we're talking twenty, thirty, forty million dollars. Well, I mean, that's, that's, two, this is life changing money. Two quick follow ups, and and then we'll get you out of here. I promise. Um, <clears throat> Jonathan Ike, who, who, speaking of the Ali biography, wrote the wrote, wrote a really good definitive uh, uh, Ali book. But he also said, um, you know, most biographers hate their subject by the time the book's over. Yeah. And it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting thing because you you know you're starting and it's in the process. Uh, you've written this whole book. It's a definitive book on Ricky Henderson. How do you uh, at this point now that the book's done, it's out. Obviously, you know what kind of job you did. Uh, how, how do you, how do you feel about Ricky Henderson as a player? Yeah, as well, a I mean, I think that was the same thing when I did the Hank Aaron book when I was working on Last Hero. Mm -hmm. You know that that that's a phrase that people have used for decades. Oh yeah, for, yeah, decades, yeah, You know, for all of us, and 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 I did not feel that for Henry. I felt even closer to Henry when I was done. Yeah, you know, and and he treated me so graciously and nicely and he was very very happy that someone had taken the time to try to understand him uh exact opposite experience with ricky ricky mm. doesn't want anything to do with the book ricky feels like the book disrespected him and i don't really know why he feels that i would ricky not feels, take that know, at all well ricky feels cheated because ricky wanted money and i don't pay for journalism and so you know and ricky did a few of the you know we talked a few times and and I told him I was working on a book. I told him I was working on a book about him. I was completely transparent about what I was working on. And I think once he recognized it was a real book and a real thing, he did what Ricky does. Okay, where's my money? Right. And right. Right, yeah. and then totally, you know, he did the, you know, Ricky did the worst thing that you could possibly do to a biographer. Not only did he not talk, but he instructed everybody around him not to talk. So he made it really, really, really difficult. And between that and the pandemic and not having the type of sourcing because the access was closed, there were no more clubhouses, right? When I was really digging in on the writing, um, it was a real challenge. It was a real different book than what I had anticipated. I don't know if it's a better or a worse book, but it's a different book than I anticipated because, you know, I started, I, I wrote, you know, signed the contract to do this book in 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. And so when... I had intended pre-pandemic, obviously, to just walk into clubhouses and talk to more and more and more people. And once those avenues closed, now you're digging around looking for phone numbers and trying to get people to talk to you. Now you have to really rely on intimacy. You got to rely on most the, the the smallest number of people who know the most about subjects that aren't just being ripped from the headlines. Mm -hmm. So it's like who can actually give me insight. So that was the reason. Well, I was. You you actually answered the second question with the with the first question because I was going to ask you the process 
uh, in the differences in your process between the Hank Aaron book and this book. Uh, I will say this. Both books, I'm holding it up right now, are fascinating and amazing. Ricky is an amazing, amazing book. Mr. Brian, I think you did, Howard, I think you did an amazing job. Uh, <laughs> I've read it, and I actually like Ricky Henderson better than I ever would have liked Ricky Henderson, I think, uh, going in, because it is it is more, like you said, it's way more intimate than what you know about the gargantuan numbers and for for a later generation that didn't see 1980 Ricky, uh, they might've saw 2001. It's, it's just a different, it's all different character. Yeah. And so yeah. um, I think you did a service not only to him, but so many people around him in the book. It is an amazing book. The book is Ricky, the life and legend of an American original. It's out everywhere right now. Howard Bryant, you can find him just about everywhere, but thank you for this. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. I am going to continue to follow. Look, Howard Bryant is a, is a man of many, look, many uh, interests. I think, I don't know when the tennis book is coming, Howard, but there's got to be <laughs> something because you are locked in on the on the, on on the the tennis uh, when it's not just the Grand Slams. You are locked in on tennis. So no, I look, follow tennis. I, can, I follow it. I love the sport. Right. You know, I was so, going to say, yeah. is there, there's got to be a look, a Nick Cario. So somebody's got to be coming. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody is coming. We'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Howard. I really, really appreciate it. This is the Black Baseball Mixtape. Uh, and hey, this is another mixtape talk. Until next time, we see it. <laughs>